Hello everyone. My name is Shubham Patwal and I'm working as a senior associate at Omega Consulting. So let's start with introduction and success stories of Omega, digitized for excellence. So if I talk about our market cap, $135 million, a boutique international consulting firm driven to create digital impact, preventing process and strategies to solve complex business problems. We exist to enable digital acceleration and Omega network to combat technological advancement. If I talk about awards of Omega uh, till 2023 to 2024, the top 10 consulting company by MarkTech Outlook in 2023 and top 100 innovators and entrepreneurs magazine in 2024 and uh, top 20 digital transformation providers 2024 by CIO review. This chart shows the management consulting industry market size, US dollar in billion. We can see here the years 2024 to 2029. So this chart illustrates the growth of management consulting industry measured in billions of US dollars, reflecting rising demand for expertise in digital transformation, strategy, and operational efficiency to help businesses stay competitive. This is the overview of Omega. We can see the Omega snapshot. Here are the five locations, 1000 plus professional networks, 20, 200 plus engagements and 40 plus years combined experience. If I talk about locations, discover the strategic locations of Omega offices, where innovation meets collaboration in Boston, Massachusetts, Miami, Florida, Chicago, Illinois, uh, New York, and uh, the Noida, India and the professional network connecting with a global network of 1000 plus professionals omega professional network is where innovation meets collaboration our expert team is here to guide your through every step of your business journey experience with 40 plus years of combined experience our professionals are dedicated to delivering top notch service and innovative solutions we support our clients to explore emerging technologies and practices with new agile practices by providing innovation for optimal business value. Our service offering in management consulting in an intelligent technology service is digital transformation consulting. If I talk about management consulting, under management consulting, we provide advisory service to the senior management of organizations with the aim of improving the effectiveness of their business strategy, organizational performance, and operational processes. Intel intelligent technology service, evaluating your business holistically using our expertise of the latest technological products and Consulatory background to provide data driven operational solutions. In the digital transformation consulting by incorporating emerging technologies to improve the experiences, design, customer experiences, and marketing transformation for the organizations. Our technical competences in the front end, like HTML, JSS, CSS. React, Bootstrap, jQuery in the big backend, Java, .NET, Spring Boot, Spring MVC, and the Python like that. We use database and Oracle database, SQL Server, MySQL, PostgreSQL, and MongoDB, and DevOps, Docker, Kubernetes, AWS, and all. In the platforms, we use Pega, Red Hat, UiPath, and the Oracle Siebel, and all integration like IBM data power, Kafka and all. And in other rabbit app queue and Redis and all. This is the Omega X tools. We use the artificial intelligence, blockchain, internet of things, ethics, stone technology, robotics and automation, augmented reality, 5D printing, virtual reality, and the cryptocurrency. 
Uh, digital workforce transformation you know, involves integrating digital technology to enhance workforce capabilities and improve product productivity. This process includes adopting tools like automation and data analytics while also developing employee skills for a digital environment. Our mission is supply all businesses with the tools and resources to accomplish social, economic and political goals through transformative improvements. Our industries are technology, healthcare, retail, hospitality, marketing, and information technology. Our vision is become a leading management consulting firm that provides solution recommendation through innovative design, divergent thinking, and technological progress. Accelerate your vision with Omega. Digitize for excellence. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another segment of Omega Consulting. Today, we're going to be looking at understanding leadership style. My name is Mike Rivera. I'm the founder of an organization called Building Brothers, where we train young men who want to become leaders in whatever area that they are in. And I'm also part of the advisory board of Omega Consulting. So it's a joy to be here with you and, and to um, join this journey with you. Uh, today, we're going to talk about what is leadership and trying to define what that is. Do you know there's over 700 different definitions of leadership style, uh, which suggests this one thing. We really don't know what it is. However, we can measure behavior concerning leadership. And so one of the definitions that I enjoy uh, out of many uh, is this one. A leader is one who takes responsibility of their life home, job, and community, which suggests strongly that is the person not only is responsible of their life, of their home, and their job and community, but also are, is accountable as well. Uh, uh, when we look at the adjectives of leadership, we find these kinds of words, a person with passion, a person that is disciplined, a person who has heart, a person who's committed, uh, a person who has motivation and motivate others, a person who's dedicated and strive for excellence, a person who, who is responsible. So we just get an idea of what uh, leadership is by looking at certain types of behavior. And so uh, Simon Sinek, I, I like he does a lot of TED Talks, and one of the things that I enjoy uh, him hearing is this particular definition right here. He says this, leadership is not about being in charge. Leadership is about taking care of those in your charge. If we as leaders do not take care of those that we've uh, delegated things with or take care of the responsibility of whatever it may be, a, a community organization or, or a corporation, if we don't take care of them, we won't be where we are today. And so therefore, we need to take care of them. And, and I'm not talking about babying or, or anything like that, but caring, literally caring for the employees that work for you or the staff that works for you. Uh, they know that you care. So it's not about being in charge and defending your authority, but it's about caring for those in your charge. It's a great definition, Simic, and I, I really enjoyed this part of the definition. Uh, Bernard Bass wrote a book called The Bass Handbook of Leadership. Uh, he is a professor at Emeritus College, and this is what he says. How do you define ethical leader? A leader whose effort is to be a benefit to others and avoid harming others. Wow. This is a really challenge for a lot of leaders to avoid harming others and give the benefit of others. Some will say, I don't care about it. I'm the boss and that's it. Well, we're going to learn a little bit more about those styles of leadership. Uh, but if you have the idea that it's the benefit of others without avoiding harming others, you're going to have a very successful organization. Uh, the five most common styles of leadership, there are many more, but my time is short and I want to share these five styles. And there's, there's five more on how to avoid certain types of leadership uh, is this. The first one is normally called commanding or authoritative leader. This is a person who holds all the power. 
This is a person who's in charge of everything and they command uh, 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 compliance. Uh, their commands are clear. Their directives are clear, but they expect immediate compliance to their uh, whatever it may be. Uh, you cannot debate. It's without question. You must do this right away. There's another term for it, and then we're going to be familiar with that term. Uh, it's called micromanaging. And so that kind of commanding leadership is one style. The other one is called democratic leader. They're the kind of leader that uh, opens the floor to employees' input and just get their ideas of what's going on. Uh, uh, they commit themselves to the decision of the group. Uh, they delegate this kind of authority. They're not afraid to encourage them to make certain types of decisions. Uh, and, they, and they're hoping that the involvement will, will pay off. It's almost like the buy-in. Uh, they got to buy into it. And, and once uh, they make those decisions, uh, the employees accept it, uh, the roles that they have to do, they get a better outcome. And so that's one style of leadership. The other style of leadership, it's called laissez-faire or delegative. They uh, give a total autonomy and trust to the team uh, to make the decisions while they take a sit back and they're part of that decision making. Um, they are the lead person, but they, they, they want the team to make the decision. This means that uh, they empower the team for uh, reasonable tasks and, and the team is accountable for even making wrong decisions. So it's not just necessarily him uh, being accountable, but the entire team pays the price as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other one is called transactional leadership. This one is almost like what they call the carrot and the stick approach. They normally work on uh, rewards and punishment. You do a great job, you receive a reward. You do a lousy job, you get a punishment or, or you be, uh, it's impunitive. Uh, you'll get a consequence for those choices, whether it be positive or negative. Uh, this kind of person uh, uh, drives members or the team to make sure that the job gets done and they do it well. And if they do it well, they get a perk. If they don't do it well, well, they're the ones are going to be receiving the bad end of the stick. They're the kind of person that sits behind a desk and says, you do this or else. Uh, I don't know if you ever met anybody like that, but they, they just recognize hard work and then lazy work, they become very punitive. I'm not saying it's a bad style of leadership. It's just one of the styles, transactional leadership. You've probably met individuals like that. Uh, and uh, that's part of being in a business or the kind of style that tries to uh, uh, drive people to do the best that they can um, without, um, uh, well, uh, without any kind of punitiveness. They don't want to punish anybody. However, uh, they want more than they're compensated for. Uh, so they're just drivers. Um, and so that's called transactional leadership. Uh, number five is one of my favorite ones. It's called transformational leadership. This kind of person um, uh, sets the example. They, they, they're looking for to the team to be encouraged. They are an uh, individual who's transformational, um, not looking to inspire followers, but they want followers to become leaders. In other words, I'm, in, I'm secure of my position as leadership, and I want you to grow. I see potential, and I'm going to help you to get there uh, as far as the leader is concerned. They take the time out to encourage their leaders. They take the time out to motivate and innovate and try to look for creative ways for their team to develop and, and strengthen them to a higher uh, um place. They look for uh, leaders among the group uh, that they have, and they look, uh, how can we shape the future with this group of people? Transformational leadership look for ways to develop more leaders, to transform more leaders, and to transform more leaders. That's what they look for. They don't necessarily look for followers. They look for followers to develop them as leaders. Uh, and this is that part. So the other part, uh, as far as uh, common styles of leadership is this. This is the stuff that we need to avoid. 
five styles of leadership. Gary McIntosh and Samuel Rima wrote a book called Overcoming the Dark Side of Leadership. These are the kinds of leadership styles <clears throat> you need to avoid. And they're compulsive leaders, uh, narcissistic leaders, uh, paranoia leaders, uh, codependent leaders, and passive-aggressive leaders. Leaders like this, uh, um, when we look at them, we've probably been around them. Uh, we felt a lot of anxiousness around some of the, some of the behaviors that we see here. But a, a compulsive leader is someone who's obsessed and unwanted. Uh, they are time-consuming individuals who are just that I need to get this thing done. And they, that, that kind of compulsiveness uh, um, um, deals with emotions. Uh, they have fear. They have doubt. Um, they, they're disgusted with things around them about themselves. And, and they work, you know, spontaneously sometimes very compulsive behavior. Uh, they engage uh, and behavior of repetitive thoughts in the head. Uh, what is this person thinking about? What is this person thinking about kind of thing? Uh, and they just continue to rehearse things in their head. This is the kind of, uh, again, another style of micromanaging. Then you have the narcissistic behavior as far as a leader. That's the kind of person who is obsessed with self-image. You know, they, I'm right, you're always wrong. I'm right, and you're always wrong. And, and no matter what you do and how you make it right, uh, it's about their image and how they look good among everybody else uh, on the back of others. Uh, that's, just not, that's a very uh, um, uh, general description of what a narcissistic behavior is, but it's also unhealthy. It, it's, uh, it brings an environment that's very tense, and, uh, and it's also very unhealthy. Um, they, they resolve... Uh, uh, the world around them, and and they just, it's all about them and how they look. The paranoia leader, oh, this is the kind, a guy who always feels threatened uh, about their position. Uh, they, they, you know, they believe that something bad is always about to happen, you know, and they bring that kind of tension within the group. They find our relationships very difficult, the paranoia leader, um, and they are easily offended and find it difficult to cope. So that's the paranoid leader. The codependent leader, however, is a kind of person that often involves placing a lower priority on one's own needs. Um, they look at the needs of others uh, excessively, and they have a low self-esteem of themselves. Uh, this is the kind of person who lives in denial, and they don't have to face uh, their pro they, they have a hard, very hard time in facing their problems. And then you have the last person here, the passive aggressive uh, leader. That's the kind of guy that I think that sticks his foot out and says, hey, smile, keep walking straight. And they stick their leg out just to trip you up. They look for ways to uh, uh, exhibit resistance. Uh, they make demands uh, um, that are not uh, um, uh, um, real, uh, that's beyond what you can do. Um, they avoid communication when there's something that's in need to be discussed. The passive-aggressive leader, you want to talk to them about certain things and they avoid you. That's the kind of person that you, you can't have as a leader. They want to avoid you and says, I'm the leader, listen to me, move on ahead. I don't want to hear anything you have to say. You have no input with anything. They deliberately stall to prevent an event or something uh, for change. They don't like, they can't do very well in change. Kind of Thank you again for joining us for this segment on understanding leadership style. I wish I can give you more, but time has run out on me. Take care, and we hope to hear from you soon. Uh, email uh, the president, uh, Keenan Thomas, concerning you want to know more about styles of leadership, uh, and he'll get in contact with me, and we can we can work out something. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. Hi, I'm Laureen Hall, and I have over 35 years in higher education uh, managing MBA programs. I recently retired, and now I'm a freelancer. So I'm here today to interview students and to, to see what his thoughts are on managing a company. And so with that, Stephen, tell me a little bit about what do you think are some ways that a founder can approach company culture and how do employees contribute to that? 
Yeah, well, that's a fantastic question to start, Maureen. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you to dive deeper into Omega Consulting. When it comes to developing a company culture, the first thing that I often think about is who is the prime person? Who are the founders? And what are their particular core values? Because I believe it starts with those core values that begin to permeate throughout the organization and people begin to adopt in their day to day. Because if you don't set that precedence, many people will begin to do things out of turn, which is not in alignment with the company vision, with the company culture. And then you start dealing with folks that perhaps have misalignment. And that's very important when you recognize where you're trying to build a, a machine, build a company of, of organized people to believe and to envision themselves reaching the goals, the missions of the organization. And you have individuals that are not aligned with those same focal points. And that begins to distance certain folks. And again, you start to lead to misalignment. So first off, it's those core values. The second, I believe, is really hiring the right people. And that's oftentimes the most challenging part is going through the process of hiring the right people for your organization, because many times you'll get it right, but oftentimes you'll get it wrong. And that should be factored in into the planning of company cultures that you may have individuals that have that misalignment, but that's all part of the process and growth for the organization. And last, it's about developing a company that has a positive work ethic. I think many times we or in a day and age with a lot of folks saying that it's important to continuously work, you know, 24 seven nonstop. But I believe it's important to have balance, right? We often coin this particular term work-life balance. And I believe work and life sometimes go intermixed, but it's important to have that balance where you are devoting your time to your family, devoting your time to your hobbies, because that in and of itself enriches the individual, which I believe, again, will help develop that positive work culture um, that Omega Consulting thrives and is soon to achieve. Okay. Well, with that said, how does the founder measure the company's success? Uh, what are some goals company can develop for the company and the departments within it? No, these are great questions. And I think when it comes to key performance indicators, KPIs, it really ranges depending on the industry standards and their particular goals. At Omega Consulting, our specific KPIs are specific to our data that we collect from our clientele, the surveys that we put out to them, especially the surveys that we receive from other companies and being able to help maneuver improvements with their technology, their software, their protocols, regulations, etc. But it really is gaining that feedback, making sure that you understand what is the best put forward. And then looking at the particular mission, as I mentioned prior, and recognizing how to calculate each step of the business to truly reach those particular parameters. Now, as I mentioned to you before, collecting that feedback is, is a measurement, is a particular tool that we use to help enhance our performance. But also it's recognizing the market research, being aware of so what's taking place in the marketplace. How is that gonna change the trajectory of your business? Many times a lot of new businesses go into the market without understanding, you know, who are the key players? You know, who are who's your competitors? You know, we talk about are you in a particular niche market? You know, the different types of markets. Are you in a sub-market? You know, are you developing a product that doesn't have an existing client base yet? Are, are you trying to develop it now so that way when the product is available that you will have a particular buyer's, right, buyer market in this instance? So it really ranges, right? And it definitely depends on the business's objectives. But I think when it comes to KPIs as a whole for Omega Consulting, it's one, collecting feedback from our clients, making sure that we have a clear understanding as to where the market trends are, market trajectory, and how we can begin to get that market research through existing reports that we distribute to our clients, ebooks, articles, blog posts um, that we solicit on a week per week basis. And then also, there's a waiting game. Right. There's a part of the process that requires us to wait and be patient to see how the market begins to turn. And if we think back to the year 2020, when we were all in COVID-19 and in quarantine, it was a significant time for businesses to really change their business models 
to accommodate working from home. And that really changed trajectory for a lot of business models, business structuring to be able to accommodate those particular needs. So really being flexible, right? Being adaptable as times begin to progress. I think that's really what's the key per performance indicators that businesses should continue to adopt and to be aware about. And as you talk about the market, how does a company identify where they fit in the market and what products they can bring to that market? finding your niche market is very important. So Omega Consulting, we are a digital transformation provider. Um, we are within the consulting industry space, which many people would often say is a very broad space to be in. You can be in management consulting, you can be an IT consultant, you can be a marketing consultant. But when I entered the market about five years ago with this idea to develop a digital transformation uh, corporation, the idea was focused around how do we help small and mid-sized companies adapt digitally? How do we get them the, the tools, the resources to be able to adopt? So at that particular juncture, I didn't really have a particular niche when it came to the marketplace with what specific industries that I was particularly targeting. And I have been so fortunate to have mentors, coaches, um, other executives that have been able to come along and really kind of walk me down the fine line of really finding exactly where we are able to provide our services in the most efficient way. And we found that our niche in this particular market is within uh, retail marketing and advertising, as well as tech corporations that are looking to leverage these types of technologies, research, paperwork in order to improve their business model and obviously improve their bottom line. Um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that uh, your company has faced? Well, I think every business has specific challenges and obviously opportunities. And I think it's important for a business to look at their business from a SWOT analysis, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And for Omega Consulting, as I mentioned to you prior, you know, starting about five years ago, it was a huge um, opportunity because a lot of organizations needed those services very much so, right? In order for them to continue putting food on the table, they needed to have a website, they needed to have a dashboard, they needed to have some sort of mobile application and functionality to be able to make a sale at that particular moment. Now that we've begun to drift further away from that, and now that we're kind of in this hybrid modality still, I've begun to notice that our opportunities as organizations, how do we enhance that? How do we improve the quality of our services? How do we really make that you know, remote interaction really tangible and have that personalized approach? I think right now our opportunity is how do we use AI tech implementation to be more customer centric, right? I'm a big proponent for being customer focused. What are the customers of tomorrow going to need? Are they going to need a dashboard? Are they going to need a mobile application? Are they going to need uh, X chat? Are they going to need these bots to do these particular tasks to improve their performance? These are the types of conversations that I like to have with my employees, with my advisory board that, Maureen, you also are a part of, because I think those are some of the opportunities that we can begin to have as individuals as corporations to begin to see this is how we can move forward and here are some of the opportunities that we can utilize now the unique part about omega is that we have something called the omega x tools where we actually go through specific areas of specialties and we actually provide these as services for businesses that are looking to adopt them such as ai if they're looking to develop vr ar mr simulations for training purposes you know, we talk about blockchain, cryptocurrencies, if they're looking to find a new medium of exchange, if they find that one of their customers may not have a, the U.S. dollar for this example, they have, you know, $100 million in Bitcoin that they're able to sell. You know, can we use that as a medium of exchange to purchase services? So really learning about the different ideas and how we can enhance the process for businesses to improve how they can better meet the needs of the customer of tomorrow. I think that's something that we often look at as an opportunity. But when it comes to some of the, you know, weaknesses or areas that we find to be threats is the lack of funding, right? Lack of funding for some of these programming. Because right now you can be extremely on point, customers are buying your product or buying the service, 
But then two, three months, a year from now, there could be a shift in the marketplace where there may not be a need for particular services. For instance, there's a lot of discussion regarding the future of professional services with the use of AI chatbots, obviously with the new version of, you know, uh, open AIs, you know, chat functionality. I mean, these particular technologies are beginning to kind of strain the need to really talk to professional. But what I'm beginning to see is that it's not necessarily that we're going to lose sight of people talking to professionals. I think that's still going to be the case. But what's going to end up happening is that it's going to be less about can you do X, Y, Z, but more about can you fix these particular technical components that I'm facing that's not really helping the business. So it's going to require professionals of the future to really focus on their technical know-how being able to be up to speed with these generative AI tools that are coming and combating with particular professional roles. And individuals are really going to have to begin to adopt, really invest into themselves, as well as with the organizations investing into their people to really upskill their workforce to be able to prepare for tomorrow. Oh, that's, that's very impressive and it's so true. Yeah. Everything changes um, so... How does the founder envision the company evolving over the next decade? That's a big question. Yeah, and you know, there's so much change that's happened in the last five years to even share that or to envision 10 years from now. But I actually have a, a beautiful board where I actually have the vision for the business. And, you know, the instinct that I have for mega consulting is extremely important because I think many people ask this question, you know, where are you headed? Where are you guys going? You guys have accomplished so much in a short period of time, but the goal has always been to supply all businesses with the tools and resources to accomplish social, economic, and political goals through transformative improvements. And truly just to break that down is as time progresses, emerging technologies are going to be a proponent for businesses. And we really want to be on the cutting edge of being experts designed at utilizing this, these cutting edge solutions and being able to help small and mid-sized corporations adopt them into their business structure to one, reduce costs, improve operational efficiency, and truly just to stay innovative. I think that's really the most important factor that organizations need to stay abreast of because if they're not innovative, their competitors are. They're going to find new ways to be, again, customer centric, more focused on design. These areas are so critical because if businesses of tomorrow are doing these things and your company is still utilizing old forums and protocols from 20, 30 years ago, it's just not going to mesh well when the new customer base comes into fruition, Gen Z, you know, Gen X, you know, this next generation, they're going to be accustomed to working with organizations that have already provided these types of platforms. So you really need to stay abreast of that. But that's where I see Omega Consulting doing that, but also making sure that we're continuing to improve our processes, continuing to improve our culture, continuing to improve our ability to upskill our workforce, because I truly believe we will be a leading consulting agency because we're focused on tomorrow. We're focused on how can we best mitigate this friction of what the future is going to be. But I believe we're responsible for creating it now. I believe the steps that we're taking now is really going to develop the footprint for the next generation that's coming up after us to say, oh, well, we can develop X chats into our programming and it's going to help with conversations with prospective buyers as an example, or we can talk about preserving history. Instead of us going into you know, a historical museum, we can actually put on goggles and be taken back 50, 100 plus years ago and know exactly what life was like. We can literally touch space, if you want to put it, and be able to physically see you know, what Abraham Lincoln perhaps saw, right? What the environment was like what rooms were like, right? And I think it's definitely going to revolutionize the game and transform how we go about enriching our learning capacity and our ability to really make a difference in our society. That's amazing. And it sounds like you've really thought this story. And, and it does make sense to continue to be Yeah. Um, so, so what do you think, um, what's your leader's, um, a leader's their leadership style? What, is your, what should it look like? Oh, my goodness. My leadership style. I think that's something that you often don't know off the top of your head until you ask the people that you work around 
how how good or how bad am I, right? <laughs> I think people are very candid to share with you about your leadership style. But if I were to highlight my approach to leadership as I would envision that I strive to be a collaborative leader, I really love to hear what everyone at the table has to offer because you're in the room for a reason, correct? And I think it's important that we have these opportunities to listen to everyone's input, but also to stretch everyone out. What I mean by that is if you're gifted in a particular area, let's go deeper, right? Why do you think the way that you think? You know, what particular facts or data or statistics are you able to bring into the conversation to maybe zero in on your particular approach? So I would also state that I'm a data-centric individual. Like I think data really speaks for itself. And for me, visualizations is, is a very important approach. But to go back to my leadership style, it's one collaborative, but also being able to leverage the data that's available to us. Um, so I'll consider myself data centric. I don't even think that's even a particular term, but we're going to coin it here for, for the sake of just giving people uh, an idea for where I believe the future is going to be, because you have, you know, chief data officers that major corporations and, you know, other meat sides corporations as well. But it's important to definitely uh, have those particular skill sets for the future as well as now. That's fabulous. Well, I, I can um, really relate to that because that was my approach to leadership. Uh, one of getting to know what everyone is thinking around the table so that we can come together and understand how we put tackle the problems that we're facing. Yeah, and there's perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. There's absolutely so, perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's how you get people to come in and, and, and be a part of the organization. If they feel like they're, what they have to say is valued. Yeah. So, um, so what um, types of interests do you have for the company in the future? I think right now where we are as an organization is that we have been prioritizing how do we listen to our customers? Like, what is it that they need? And recently we came out with a dashboard. It's called the Omega Dashboard. And it really is a project management tool that we have developed in-house to really mitigate the issues of our clients having to utilize different platforms, different uh, software tools that perhaps is outside of our um, reign to help them with managing their data, managing their contracts, uh, portfolios, um, and also to be able to see the progress of projects in real time. I think that's been a major concern. And I think as we progress toward the future, it's going to continue on that particular um, pathway because I recognize that our customers care more about how well we can get the job done than about anything else. They're more focused about their business, their needs, and how they can be able to reach their goals. And that's really what I believe the future of the business is about, is how well we can be able to align with our clients' goals and their mission, but more importantly, provide them with the resources to really be a platform for them to excel, right? And to develop those partnerships securely. Um, I'm a relationship-based pers person, and I, and I try my absolute best to do that in every single conversation that I get to have with different people. And one particular uh, area that I find to be a passion of mine is whenever I'm at an event or an executive summit of, of some sort, I definitely find that it's important to have those conversations, develop those relationships, you know, ask those integral questions, because that's at the end of the day, what people care most about is, you know, do you care about me? Do you see me? Do you hear what I'm saying? And do you respect me? And I think if you can be able to accomplish those three or four things, I think that definitely is a way that we can be able to develop those partnerships and those relationships that can be able to stand the test of time. But when I think about the future, it's definitely going to be part partner focus, right? I understand Omega Consulting um, may never be the, the largest corporation, but I know it's going to be one of the finest because we're going to have very high quality leaders and people who are really good at communicating that really love other people. And I think that's really something that is often overlooked in the hiring process. And I think we need to bring that back into fruition as we make decisions on people that are going to be part of the organization. And that, to me, is the most important part. 
Uh, and that's what I see us integrating into the future is, is our partnership program, really uh, securing that, making it really accessible to small and mid-sized companies and continuing to enhance our existing footprint. Um, we already have a digital hub with a subsidiary business called Omega Helix, which is an AI a uh, modern business where we actually work with small businesses on leveraging AI tools uh, such, such as XChat and developing other AI modules um, and other testings if they're interested in those particular domains. But it's important to develop those areas and create, create those communities first um, because I think those are going to help us in one, refining our professional services, but over time um, assist with developing the greater community at, at large. And uh, how would one get access to this platform? Yeah, well, on our existing website, Omega Consulting Period Online, um, we actually have a uh, client login portal where it's free of charge. You can just sign up. Um, it takes no more than less than two minutes to sign up and create an account, and that'll give you immediate access. Uh, what we will then do is pair you with an individual from our team They'll sort of walk you through the process of developing your profile, and we'll talk about different client engagements, what your mission, what your goal is. We have a whole process in place to help from point A to, to point Z, if you will, to really make sure that we understand the individual's business goals. And from there, we'll start an engagement. Okay, fabulous. Thank you for talking to me today. I really appreciate hearing more about Amelia. Marine for just making the time uh, to host this conversation. Um, this has been fantastic. Absolutely.